We will continue with statistical learning and um, I want to give some background around this. Statistics is always lurking around in machine learning. It's not taught explicitly in every course, but you should know this. One reason is that the machine learning which we, which we learn and the methods which we get are developed for decision making. And decision making has always something to do with personal opinion and personal assessment. And this again is computed with Bayesian statistics. That means all machine learning at heart should be also viewed under the aspect, the viewpoint of Bayesian statistics. We don't take too much time to give a deep introduction into this, but we'll teach you an important method, namely the knife base approach to machine learning. But you should, if you have time, also take a deeper look at the so-called subjectivism and uh, the Bayesian statistics, because if you want to go to explainable decisions, you need this. We also know that you have learned statistics already in other courses, be it in the school, but also in your study courses at the university. And um, some of the elements which we present here or have presented already are repetitions. Don't worry about this. We will this make this repetition very concise, succinct, up to the point, and it should help you, should help you to quickly go through the material. Okay, um, the statistics that we do is um, here, it's called actually stochastics. It has to do with probability theory and um, the, its application via knife base. A random experiment, short recap from last week, is an experiment, is a procedure, and um, it has an outcome, and we don't know its outcome beforehand. If we would know it, the randomness would be gone. The set of all possible outcomes is called sample space. And each subset of the sample space is called event. That means we have up to the power set of possible events. An event happens or occurs with the experiment outcome is a member of the event. All events are called event space. There are clear and typical canonical events, the impossible event, the certain event, the complementary event, and the elementary event. The explanation of what statistics and probabilities are is not really clear. Up to now, there are people who think it's something with uh, mechanics, these are the plus people. There are people who think we have only to count, these are the frequentist people. There are the Bayesian people who say statistics is only what I feel what happens. But common to all is the computation of statistical or probability values. And this is based on Kolmogorov's insights. He introduces the so-called probability measure. The probability measure is a function that assigns to each event a number. And the properties of this function are very simple, namely it's positive, it is normalized, and it fulfills this additional rule. If two events do not share an outcome, then we can get the probability of the common event, A or B, as a simple addition. This is a big step forward into working with probabilities, and we can work without probabilities without really understanding what they are.
this was around the material that I presented last week. And now we will continue with the elements that we need to understand base rule and the knife base algorithm. I will start with conditional probabilities. I will then bring the definition of total probabilities and explain more about the independence of events. And after this, we will get the mechanisms for knife base. You always start with a probability space. This is also invented or was presented by Kolmogorov. This means a probability space, we have a sample space. We have the event space and we have this fantastic probability measure. This triple is called probability space. And now when we are giving two events, from the event space, we can think about the probability of the occurrence of one event A, given that in a certain other event B is known to have occurred. I'm quite sure that you know this formula. We say probability of A under condition B is this here is defined as a probability of the joint event A and B related to the probability of B. Looks simple, computation is simple, but understanding can be very intricate. I have presented an illustration for you. Here we see the set omega. These are all outcomes. No more other outcomes can happen. Let's say that this omega is about weather descriptions. A subset here, I have called it A, is the event that the road is wet. First, I would like you to observe that the areas which you see here are interpreted. That means if you see this size of A, the relation of this size to the relation of omega tells us something about the probability. And if A takes about, let's say, 20% of omega here, we can say the probability of A, the probability of the road is wet, is 0.2, 20%. Here's another event. It's raining. And you see these two events, A and B, overlap. And the shaded overlap area is the area when it's raining and the road is wet. And the probability of this combined event, of course, is smaller than the probability of A alone. Look onto this area of the combined event compared to the area of omega. We can now relate this combined event also only to B. In natural language, you would say the road is wet when it's raining. You see the subtle difference. We can express in our language the difference between a combined event and a conditional combined event. And what you see here, if you relate the combined event to B, you see that it takes much more of the area of B than it took before from the area of omega. That means the probability that the road is wet when it's raining is much higher, perhaps 80% here. We relate this area to this area. And this is exactly what the formula expresses. Okay, another definition. Uh, perhaps a few important consequences. Yes, I would like uh, to go through these. 
The first consequence is a simple algebraic transformation of the definition. We multiply by the denominator. Denominator, you see this here, and then see that uh, the probability of A and B can be written as a probability of e, B times the conditional probability of A under B. Now, we know that forming the intersection is a commutative operation. That means P from A and B is the same like P from B and A because they happen at the same time and we cannot know whether there's a difference. And because of this identity here, we can apply the identity to the right-hand side, which directly follow from the definition of the conditional probability. And this identity written as an equation here can be transformed. We resolve it to P probability of A under B and the rest. And the point is out because this already is base rule. You can easily derive it by yourself. You start with the definition of conditional probability. You think about the commutative property of the joint event, exploit the identity and get base rules. Another point is important to mention. If we condition events, for instance, here we condition everything under B. So complementary considerations between A and not A, that they are related as one minus are given as well. We say, Considered as a function in the parameter A and the constant B, the conditional probability also defines a probability measure. Be careful. This applies for a fixed condition. It is quickly mixed up with something like this here. You see that I use a complementary event as condition experiment. Of course, this is not true. It looks like a subtle syntax difference, but it's much more. The illustrating example shall give you some insight. Let's say we know, this is written here, that the probability for the event the road is wet under the event it's raining is 0 0.9. Then observe that this information, the 90% probability of the road is wet, gives us no knowledge regarding the wetness under the complementary event. It's not raining. Perhaps the road is always wet, perhaps the road is never wet, we don't know. The next building block which we need, total probability. Total probability again starts with probability space. You know it already. We have samples. We have events and we have a probability measure. And what we now do is we partition omega into k different events, a1 up to ak. And these events cover omega completely. You'll see this here. And they are mutually exclusive. It means the A's themselves do not overlap. Then we can take any other event here called B from the event space and express this event as the sum 
over all partition events A. And we have to consider the level at which each A is covered. I've illustrated this, no worries. Here again is our omega, all possible outcomes. A partitioning into K different A's might look at this. I've shown here a uniform form of the AIs, but this is not necessary. You can also think of these, these, and so on. Important is, here's a different partitioning, that the A's cover the entire omega and that these A's are mutually exclusive. And we now take an experiment, uh, sorry, an event B. It covers also some of these A's. And we see that certain A's are not covered at all, certain are covered completely, and cert certain are covered to a certain point here. Yeah. And I can now sum up over all A's and uh, I see here that this here is zero and the term is zero. For an A here, I see that this here is one. And uh, for an A here, I see that the probability depends on the percentage of the covered area. This gives you more than an intuition. This is exactly what happens. Omega is covered by all AI, and B can be expressed in terms of omega. This is the idea of total probability. The proof, which is also shown here, follows exactly this, this figure. The probability of B is, of course, the probability of omega and B, because this here is B. And here we exploit the completeness of the partitioning by replacing omega with all A's. And um, here, where we can apply this, con this uh, combination to each A, we exploit the exclusiveness of the AIs. This is allowed. And then we can put together the sum and write it as here, as the sum of the conditional probabilities. Okay, what do we need else? And the last element, statistical independence. We start with a probability space and we are looking at two events, A and B. A and B are called statistically independent if the following condition holds this if with the 2f means if and only if the following equation holds. Yeah. If we obtain the probability of the combined event simply by multiplying the probabilities of the single events, then we call A and B statistically independent. We call it statistically independent because we do not know the truth in the real world. They might not be independent, but they look independent. By the way, this rule is also called the so-called multiplication rule or the specific multiplication rule. The generic multiplication rule, this is here, is a direct consequence on the conditional probability. Only if you encounter these terms when reading different material. Yeah. 
This statistical independence is very important for us and I've also provided some illustrations because this independence gives rise to different equations, which I have written here. Again, we look at omega. Again, we look at an event A. And again, we see that the event A takes about 70% of the area of omega. That means the probability of A could be 0.7, 70%. And the area here, which is not A, is a probability of not A. This is the second event, B. I've uh, simply drawn this. Don't be confused. This here is B. And these two events are independent. I claim this now. But you can also do a computation, namely if you multiply these areas, you will find out that the combined area is the result of the multiplied areas. And this is also geometrically clear because B is a so-called guillotine cut or rectangular cut from omega rectangular to A it takes exactly the proportion of B that B takes from omega. It means always if you partition a set in this way, sorry, um, oh, it is, uh, yesterday I had also this uh, tool is crashed. Um, Martin, uh, I have a complete crash of um, the Adobe Illustrator to restart the program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. yes, I will repeat a bit, but not too much. Okay. Recording's running again. Yes. Um, where are we? Um, we are at the moment collecting the tools that we need to apply Bayesian statistics in terms of the NAV base rule, and we need for this to understand, uh, of course, Kolmogorov, sample space, event space, probability space. We need to understand conditional probability and total probability. These definitions have been presented, and we are now going with the final definition, which we need the definition of statistical independence. And I explained to you, yes, we call to events statistically independent if their probabilities stand in the following relation that you see here, the probability of the combined event equals the product of the probabilities of the two single events. And this is called multiplication rule, the specific multiplication rule, the generic multiplication rule is the rule here, which comes from the conditional probability definition. And um, if two events are statistically independent, that means they look independent with regard to their mass, we have very interesting identities that hold, that hold and I was explaining and illustrating them. And uh, again, you see here our entire set omega and you said see an event A and the probability of the event A can be directly assessed by the size of its area related to omega. Let's say A is about 70%. P of A is 0 0.7. And um, this is an event B and these two events are independent by definition because they fulfill this equation. And what I wanted to express is two events, if you draw them graphically, are always independent if they are rectangular to each other. Yes, it means uh, if you have this situation with omega here and 
then you do these splits here, these Virgin splits or rectangular splits, then you always get independent events. This is very important to know. It always gives you independent events. Yeah? And if you do something different, Speak uh, this whole this way. The events are not often not independent. They promote each other or prohibit each other, and so on. Okay. A and B are independent and hence fulfill this identity here. Equally interesting, A under B, you see, I relate the joint event here to B, A under B equals A under not B. You can verify this also geometrically. The proportion which the joint event takes here related to B equals the proportion of this joint event related to not B. And finally, perhaps the most important identity is that A under B, the conditional event of A under B is the probability of A. That means if you have two independent events, the probability of A does not change under the condition. That means the area that A takes under omega is the area that A and B take under B. That means if two events are independent, you do not get, gain knowledge if you know something about the experiment. And uh, in the reigning example before, the events were not independent. You see that the joint event takes a much bigger portion of B then A takes under omega. And if you know something about B, you know more about A. These two events are not independent. B impacts, promotes, or facilitates A. Okay. This statistical independence of two events can be extended this definition to arbitrary number of events. This is done here in the next page, but uh, we don't uh, need to look at this syntax thing now. You have to understand this idea here and to know this idea applies to K events as well. 